morning and welcome to Abundant Life Christian Fellowship. We are so glad you are here online with us this morning. And as you can see, we are online only with no in-person gatherings this week. And the board made this decision after uh, two people in the congregation tested positive, the um, ongoing rise in cases in Stark County, and a couple of our key leaders were exposed to COVID-19 uh, as well. So we made the decision to close this week to do a deep cleaning of the church Make sure that everyone continues to stay safe and healthy. And the hope and the prayer is that we can open again next Sunday, November 8th, coming back in person again. So that is our goal. If you want more information about this, you can go online at www.alcfohio.org and there'll be all kinds of information there about this week and how to come back in person with us next week. Um, if you are joining us right now, we would love for you to comment um, who that you're watching, who you're watching with. Just start that conversation in the comments um, during the worship, during the sermon. Just continue to comment, interact with each other. Even though we have to be online, we can still build community. And we have seen that so much over the past few months, how we can still build community even though we're online. So make sure to interact, say hi to each other. Yeah, just have fun in the comments while we are here together this morning. And I also want to mention that you can give online at www.alcfohio.org backslash give. And we are so thankful for those that have come alongside the church to give um, and partner with us financially. It is such a gift. And we're actually going to, before we dive in, we're going to hear um, an annual review from two of our leaders. And this is just a prime example of how you are giving doubles and triples and uh, such. And so before we head in, we're going to hear from Lori Hewitt, our Rooted Children's Ministry leader, and Blaine Hewitt, our Uprising um, Youth Ministry leader, and how we are being able to disciple the next generation. So check it out. Hi, my name is Lori Hewitt, and I am the Children's Ministry team leader here at Abundant Life. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about our ministry and who we serve, what we do, and some of the highlights uh, from last year, and then some of the things that we're planning for 2021. Um, currently, our ministry serves about 50 children from uh, ages nursery up to uh, fifth grade, and um, we serve them on Sunday mornings um, in the nursery and then within four classes. Um, that we do lessons and Bible stories and activities and fun things with the kids just to teach them uh, more about Jesus. Um, our goal um, as a children's ministry is to, is to bring kids closer to Jesus and to plant those seeds of faith um, in them at a young age so that when they grow older, um, they can foster um, that relationship with Jesus and then also um, learn more about him and get deeper into a relationship with him. Uh, we also want to foster that relationship between the child and the parent. Um, and so some of the act activities that we do throughout the year, we um, want to make sure that we are fostering that connection between the child and the parent um, as well. Um, some of the highlights from this year, um, if you can remember back um, to the fall of 2019, uh, we did have a Children's Ministry uh, Character Award. And that's one of the uh, big things that we really like to do in Children's Ministry is to celebrate how God made each of the children individually. And just those um, good things, those, those attributes that God has put in the children so, uh, so that they can serve Jesus. Um, and uh, so we were able to do that. We haven't been able to do that this year yet, but we still hope to be able to schedule that at some point. Um, another highlight is that we were at, able to add another class um, due to the growth um, of the children's ministry. Um, so we were able to split the third through fifth grade class um, into two classes just because of the number of kids that we had. Um, and also because this is, this is really cool that um, grandparents um, and aunts and uncles and even just friends have been bringing their children uh, to children's ministry, uh, to church, which is really great because you can tell that some of these kids, this is the first time uh, that they've heard about Jesus. 
Um, the other thing uh, highlight was the drive-by Easter egg hunt um, or the Easter hunt. Um, and so that was fun. That was fun to put it together, but it was also fun to see the families just having fun together when there wasn't a lot happening and uh, to see them driving by my house and getting to wave to them that that was really that was really cool um, right now we have about 25 volunteers um, in the nursery and in the um, in the rooted ministry downstairs um, which is just a huge blessing uh, we would never be able to do children's ministry without um, our volunteers and just one um, volunteer that really stepped up this year was Leanne uh, Hartman. Um, when we split the class of the third through fifth grade class, she was just all about it. She said she would teach every week. Um, we didn't even have a room for them, but she really, we truly, she just really worked hard to try to figure that out. And that class um, is full of some uh, energy driven boys, uh, but she wasn't scared about it and she just dove in um, and really had a, a great attitude about it. So I just want to make sure that she knows that I appreciate that definitely about her. Um, this year's theme, uh, Let There Be Light, A Year of Clarity, Hope, and Light. Um, we hope to this year a couple ways to be able to implement that. We don't really know what children's ministry um, is going to look like um, for the rest of 2020 and into 2021, but um, we are planning some activities that would foster the giving hope and light. Um, especially during Christmas. And so we have something scheduled and something set up called um, uh, Light Em Up, um, which we'll be giving you a lot more details about that. But um, I just think it's really important for our children to be able to share the light that they have and the hope that they have. Um, children are so resilient and they have this like hope and just happiness and joy in them that no matter what happens um, that they're able to share that and so i want them we want to create an environment and some activities that they are able to do that to be able to share that light so make sure that you keep watching for that video about christmas because um, it i think it'll be a good time uh, for your family to be able to share the light um the other thing is that um we, our next curriculum, uh, when we are able to start uh, children's ministry again, will be the basics of the faith. And so I think that that will create clarity for our kids um, and even some of the newer children that have been a part of ALCF for a long time. Um, so just to end, I just want to say, kids, that I miss seeing you every week and hanging out with you. Um, and I just, I just want to make sure that you guys know that I think and that I pray for you. That if you're, as a parent, um, if there's any like um, prayer requests that you have, um, to send those to me, text them to me. Because usually I hear those from the kids um, during the week. Um, and I think it would be really cool just if you would reach out and just let me know if there's something that I could pray for your family about or even for your kids about. So thanks so much, and I hope to see you soon. Hi, my name is Blaine Hewitt, and I'm the youth pastor here at ALCF. Um, we call it Uprising Youth, and uh, it's just for the kids in our church or even outside the church from grades 6 to 12. And our goal as a youth ministry is really just to come alongside kids in their journey with Jesus and help them along the track and in introducing them to Jesus um, and helping them grow in their relationship with him. Um, <laughs> like the three highlights are that we just kind of started um, this year and that we started off great and it was so awesome. Um, another would be just getting to know um, some of your kids and some of the kids that have come to our youth group but they're all so awesome and it's so awesome to build relationships with them. And finally it's just also um, we've had so many like fun and cool times is that we just um, creating memories with the kids. Yeah, I, I think that even um, during the pandemic, all of our leaders did such a great job of just texting the kids um, and just staying in contact with them. And even um, when we once we got out of quarantine, we were able to meet sometimes outside during the summer. And we just had a great time um, connecting again and just get kind of having a getting back to normal like 
um, when we would do slip and slide kickball and um, we had a few people wipe out um, sometimes and I was one of them. And um, the way that we have latched on to let there be light um, and we've also kind of added a theme to this year and it's called Welcome Home and we and I believe that it goes right across the right across the same line as let there be light because we just want to show kids um, that they are welcomed in their home is Jesus and that ultimately too that the youth group and the people in the youth group can also be found in home and that is a safe and trustworthy place that they can show their authentic selves um, during that time so that we can all also get closer to Jesus who is our ultimate home and so shedding light into this world and yeah and just showing them who they are. I'm really excited about this year because I think there's so much opportunity to connect with um, just connect with people and you know um, I think what COVID has kind of shown us is that how important relationships really are and I can already see it from our kids of just connecting that how much um, connection really um, matters and so we really really want to focus on that this year and you know even uh, working with the legacy project and stuff too like um, just I'm just excited for what God can do when we when we do have a place that is safe for everybody to come into and experience Jesus and that is what really excites me about this year yeah and if you guys could just be really really praying is that we've had some amazing things already happen in our first five weeks that we have been meeting as a youth group um, in the past five weeks because we basically had 12 kids um, be, want to begin a relationship with Jesus and say yes to Jesus and you know now um, it is so amazing that salvation is happening um, but we also want to dig deeper into who Jesus really is and help them go along this journey and um, yeah just go deeper into who Jesus is at the same time that we are experience, experiencing salvation so if you could please pray for them in the new um, yeah just the kids that have begun their relationship with Jesus. Good morning, Abundant Life. It's good to be with you virtually again. I'm so uh, glad to just hear what's going on in the youth of our church and with uh, Lori and Blaine as the leaders of the children and youth ministry. It's so exciting to see that. And I'm just so glad because they're the next generation of this church. They're the ones who are going to be spearheading things, leading worship someday, leading those ministries someday, pastoring this church. I'm just excited about that. And so we just uh, really are grateful for them. I want to pray into them. Um, kids, if you're uh, listening and, and singing this morning uh, with us, we just want you to know how awesome you are and how loved you are. And I'm going to uh, read here from Psalm 105, uh, verses 1 through 5, before we get into the singing this morning. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon His name. Make known His deeds among the peoples. Sing to Him. Sing praises to Him. Tell of all His wondrous works. Glory in His holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. That's us. Let, let us rejoice. Seek the Lord in His strength. Seek His presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that He has done, His miracles and the judgments He uttered. O offspring of Abraham, His servant, children of Jacob, His chosen ones. That psalm tells us to remember the wondrous works that He has done and the miracles and the judgments that He's uttered because we are His chosen ones. How amazing, how beautiful is that? So we're going to start this morning with one of our newer songs, Graves in the Gardens. I told Haley I will not sit down to play this song because I just love it so much. It's so um, exciting and, and just encouraging to sing. And so that's why we're standing here. So let's sing this out together.
satisfied here in your love. You're the 
with a melody you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone and I'm no longer a slave Father, I 
child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear I can rest I am a child Thank you, Jesus, that we are no longer slaves to fear. We are no longer slaves to sin. We are your children. Because of that, we have peace. You have peace like a river. Even when sorrows like sea billows roll, we have peace like a river. And we can say with our souls, it is well, no matter what we have going on, no matter the lot. So thank you for that, Jesus. When peace like a
thank you so much that it is well with our souls because of what you've done for us. And because of that, we don't have to fear when the storms come, when the waves come crashing over us, we don't have to fear. And when we do fear, you treat us so gently. You don't shame us for it. You understand it, you get us, you empathize with us. And then you remind us that we don't have to. And we can trust in you. And so Father, we pray that you would help us to do that this morning. I would trust in you and the work that you're doing. Pray that as we continue to learn about how we were made, how we were made especially for rest, for celebration, we pray that you would speak loudly to our hearts, or softly as you would please, and that we would be open to hearing whatever it is you have for us this morning. Thank you, it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. Good morning. Thank you uh, for joining us. We are praying that this Sunday is the only Sunday we'll have to do our service exclusively online. We hope to be back in person next Sunday. We encourage you to join us in that prayer. I am happy though that we have the technology to continue progressing through our Made for This sermon series. This year at our church, the theme is let there be light, a year of clarity, a year of hope, a year of growth. And we want to create clarity around a variety of topics for you this year. And one of them is what we're talking about in this sermon series. What on earth are you here for? What were, what were you designed for? What's the purpose and meaning of life? And so we're hoping to help you answer those questions. We know that there are a lot of people asking those questions especially now that our world um, is experiencing what it is experiencing i think with this pandemic and with the quarantine that we did have it really gave people to to time to think a little bit more than what what they normally had and I, and i think some people started asking those big existential questions and so they really are the most important questions we can ask and so we want to provide some answers for you based on what god has said in his word um, today's big idea of, of the message is that we were made for rest we were made for rest and i i want to show you that that's the case and you will see that rest was woven into the fabric of creation. You will see that slaves do not rest and you will see that we can rest well. So those are the three things that I wanna talk about starting with rest was woven into the fabric of creation. Last week, uh, as we started our journey uh, through this sermon series, we looked at the fact that God has always existed. God the Father, the Son, and God the Spirit have always existed in loving community and in coordinated creativity. And part of what it means to be made in God's image is that we were designed, God designed us with the relational capabilities, the intellectual capabilities to join in on the Godhead's loving community and coordinated creativity. Um, the way that we join in on God's coordinated creativity in the world is by fulfilling what scholars have called the cultural mandate. When God told the first humans to fill the earth, to subdue the earth, to reign over the earth, what, what God was commanding those, the, the first humans to do was to create culture, to create families, societies, cities, and to you know spread out all over the the world now what's extremely important to note is that before god had the first humans 
join in on the Godhead's coordinated creativity, they rested. God rested and they rested because God, he creates everything uh, in the created order in six days. And on the sixth day is the pinnacle of his creation. He creates uh, human beings. But then on the seventh day, the first day of the human's existence, God rested and the humans rested. And, and this is important for us to see because we are supposed to work from rest. We are not supposed to work, 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 and then crash in to rest as like a last kind of resort. No, we are to start with rest and work out of rest. Check out Genesis 2, 1 through, one through 3. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. And so not only did the first humans rest on the seventh day, not only did God rest on the seventh day, but God blessed and sanctified the seventh day. And in doing so, what God was doing was affirming the goodness of a day of rest once a week. And he was setting it as a pattern for humans to follow so that they would flourish, right? This was a gift to the first humans. It was designed, uh, this day of rest for human flourishing. Uh, and, and so we see from the beginning that rest was woven into the fabric of creation. And that tells us a few things, doesn't it? First of all, it tells us that rest is an essential part of what it means to be a human being. And therefore, it is essential to a thriving life. And it's a major component of living the abundant life that God has created us to live. This, of course, means that the opposite is true as well, right? That if we don't have a regular routine of stopping and resting, and if we're living out of sync with the rhythm that God uh, put into creation from the beginning and hardwired us for, we're going to feel less human. Overwork and a lack of rest leads to us feeling nothing more like nothing more than a cog in a wheel or a machine or a human doing instead of a human being. And it has a, a way of just sucking the joy and the life right out from us. And a lack of rest causes us to suffer in a whole plethora of ways. Think about the effects of a lack of rest on an individual, physical effects, emotional effects, often mental, it has a mental impact. It, it affects us spiritually and often affects us relationally as well. So because rest was woven into the fabric of creation, we know that it's an essential part of what it means to be human. Secondly, it teaches us that it's a major way that we reflect the image of God. Have you ever thought about that? One major way that we reflect the image of God is by resting. Because God rested, right? And God is a God of rest. And we'll talk more about that in a bit. Another thing that uh, rest being woven into the fabric of creation tells us is that God is not a tyrant. He... He is not a boss or a CEO that just runs his employees or if he's, he's not a king that just runs his subjects into the ground with hard, oppressive labor. He wants his people to get ad adequate rest and he commands that they do it for their own good. These truths are truths that Americans really need to hear and internalize because we live in this country that really <laughs> values and worships overwork, don't we? And, you know, we celebrate the, the movers and shakers of the world. We applaud those who are working 70 hour work weeks. We talk about cities in our country that, that never sleep. We admire those who get at the office first and leave the office last. We worship people who worship work. And then if you combine that 
spirit of our American culture with the technology that is available to us today that allows us to always be connected to work, you have this recipe for uh, work, workaholism is what, what you have. And you really have an environment where for many it's irresistible for them to uh, not overwork. They, they can't resist overworking. Um, and of course, the negative impacts of overworking are irresistible as well. And that's why we see, I, I think, such high levels of stress and burnout and anxiety and depression and a whole host of health issues, failing marriages and failed parenting because people are addicted to their work. This is the truth about our need for rest and that we were made for us, made for it is also something that Christians need to hear because let's be real. Most Christians uh, that we know um, are quite overworked and overcommitted. And instead of influencing the world as far as work and rest and a healthy rhythm of that is concerned, what we have seen is that the world has had a greater influence on the church in, in this way. Um, and so we Christians need to, to hear the importance of rest. Um, in fact, I know of a very few Christians who have a regular pattern of rest the way that God designed it to be. And, and more on that in, in a bit as well. And I would confess that my rhythm in my practice of, of rest is inconsistent and messy at best. And when God really put this on my heart five years ago or so that I was made for rest, um, it's been inconsistent and messy as I've tried to lean into that and develop a pattern of rest in my own life. And I remember, especially when I was first starting out, really trying to uh, rest and take a day of rest a, a week, I felt antsy. I felt, um, I, I mean, I love to get things done and be productive. And I, I, I realized that I was I probably addicted to the endorphin release that comes with being productive and getting things done. I often struggle with boredom and feelings of blah when I was trying to to rest. And uh, um, sometimes I would even struggle with guilt, you know, guilt that, man, you know, I, I, I should be doing this and I should be doing that. And so my own practice has been rather inconsistent and messy. And this leads us to our second takeaway for today. And that is slaves do not rest. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, Moses, he's reminding the nation of Israel about the Ten Commandments. Now, God gave the nation of Israel the Ten Commandments so that they would know how to live in life-giving ways, so that they would flourish as a nation, and so that they would be a light and a blessing to the other nations of the world. And when Moses reviewed the, the Ten Commandments with the nation of Israel, this is what he shared in Deuteronomy 5. 15. And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Moses was reminding the Israelite people that they were once slaves, right? And when they were slaves, they couldn't observe the Sabbath. They didn't have the, the luxury of being able to take a day off a week to rest. They were slaves, and therefore they had to do what Pharaoh told them to do. But due to God's gracious rescue of the Israelite people, they now were freed from that yoke of slavery and were able to observe the Sabbath and they should do so. And, and, and that's what we see uh, being spoken in Deuteronomy 5.15. I also want us to see that I believe there's a, an important truth embedded within that verse. And here it is. If you habitually overwork and aren't able to rest the way that God designed you to rest, again, we'll, we'll talk about that in, in a bit. 
You are a slave to something or someone, but it is not God. If you habitually overwork and aren't able to rest the way God designed you to rest, you are a slave to something or someone, but it is not God. Uh, author and former pastor Tim Keller, he calls this the work underneath the work. And what he means is that your overwork is really a symptom of a deeper problem of idolatry. If you overwork and you can't take a day off a week to rest, um, or you do take a day off a week to rest and maybe physically you're resting, but your mind is not resting, then you have to ask like, why am I working so much? Who am I really serving? Who am I, who or what am I really a slave to? Who or what am I really trusting? Because if I was serving God, if I was living for him, if I was really trusting him, I would obey his command to rest. And you may, after answering those questions, you may discover that you're overworking and not resting is due to the fact that you fear your boss and what he will think of you or what your coworkers will think of you if you actually take a day off a week and disconnect from your work. And if that's the case, then the opinions of other people are your real master. That's what you're really looking to for your value, your, your significance. Now, maybe you ask those questions and you, and you discover that the reason that you're overworking is because you believe that if you don't, if you take a day off a week, uh, uh, t take a day off uh, each week, that your company or your team or your organization, it will fall apart. Well, in that case, what you're really trusting in is your own abilities and capabilities. And it's like you're believing that you hold the world together, right? Like that you're omnipotent, right? You, that you, without you, you're, you're irreplaceable and things just fall apart without you. And it's, you're thinking that it's a, it's a lack of trust that if you take your hands off, of, of work for a day a week, then, well, God, he, he can't possibly hold things together for that day. And so I, I've got to work. Maybe you ask questions about your overwork and you discover that um, the reason you're overworking and not finding time to rest is because you want more. You want more stuff. You want a better home. You want be a better car. You want to go on better vacations. And maybe the God you're really serving is the God of materialism. And you're trusting in that for your satisfaction and significance. And you're trusting in that to make you feel secure in life. And we could go on with examples, but we, if we're overworking, and that's a habitual pattern for us, we have to ask these questions. What is the work underneath the work? What is the thing that we are um, worshiping? What idol are we serving that is really behind the symptom of overwork? Now, one caveat here, and that is, um, there are times in our life where we simply cannot avoid overwork. Um, for example, if you wanted to start a business, there's a good chance that you're going to, especially maybe for the first year, or maybe even the first three years, you might have to really work a lot in order to get that business up and running. Same thing as if you know, if you're going to go to med school and become a doctor, there might be a stretch in your life where you're really going to have to work a lot of hours in order to accomplish that goal. And then there are people in the world that have to overwork simply to survive. A lot of people, unfortunately, are in this position where, um, especially in impoverished countries where they have to work two jobs or they have to work you know, 14 hours a day just to have enough money to put food on the table, uh, to put clothes on their families' backs and to have a roof over their families. Ahead, Surely God understands these things. Uh, what we're addressing here is the people that don't have to overwork to survive, but yet choose to do so and choose not to rest. And then you have to look at what is that work underneath all that overwork?
And that leads us to our third takeaway. We can rest well. How do we rest well, right? How do we rest the way that God has designed us to rest? Well, let me uh, share uh, and go back to uh, Genesis 1.31, and then I'll reread. I've already read Genesis 2, 1 through 3 to you, but let me reread it. So Genesis 1.31, then God saw everything he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. And then Genesis 2, 1 through 3, which immediately follows, 131. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it, he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. These verses reveal three important truths in terms of what it means to rest like God. God's rest included stopping, noticing, and celebrating. Stopping, noticing, and celebrating. What did God stop? He Well, he stopped his work, right? He stopped producing. He stopped creating. He stopped engineering. He stopped planning. Genesis 2, 1 through 3 mentions not once but twice that God rested. He stopped. It emphasizes that fact. That's the stopping. Well, what did God notice, right? Because he stopped and he noticed. Well, God noticed the products of his work. Genesis 1.31 tells us that he saw everything that he had made, meaning that God noticed the stars, the sun, the moon, the trees, the plants, the creatures of the sea, the creatures of the land, the creatures of the air. He noticed the oceans, the mountains, the rainforests, the wetlands, the deserts, the prairies and so on and so forth. And of course, he, he, he noticed the high point of his creation, human beings, us. That's the noticing. What about the celebrating? Well, God, he didn't just notice the fruit of his labor. He also celebrated the goodness of what he had produced. Uh, throughout the creation account, if you were to read through Genesis 1, it has this statement that is repeated that, you know, after each, after God makes, creates each component of our uh, world, he says, you know, the, 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 the scriptures say that it was good. But then, after he's done making his crown jewel, us human beings, uh, Genesis 131 tells us that God looked at everything he had made, and this time he says it was very good. And so what God is doing is he's taking time to stop and to notice and then to celebrate the goodness of what he had made. Goodness here, as um, Walter Brueggemann uh, notes, does not refer primarily to a moral quality, but to an aesthetic quality. And therefore, it might be better translated lovely, pleasing, beautiful. God was celebrating the loveliness, the, the beauty uh, of creation, and it pleased him. How do we rest well like God, and how do we rest well like the first humans? Well, we take a day a week to stop producing, to stop our planning, to stop creating, to notice the work that we produced in that past week that God empowered us to produce, and then we celebrate the goodness of it. That's how we rest well. And I would add one more thing to the stopping, noticing, and celebrating. In Mark 2, at the end of Mark 2, Jesus, he's walking with his disciples uh, through a field, a grain field, and there his disciples are plucking some heads of grain. And the Pharisees, which were the Jewish religious leaders of Jesus's day, they notice this is happening and they get upset because you're not supposed to do any work on the Sabbath. And they had a lot of extra tra traditions that they attached to the Sabbath. And for them, Plucking a head of grain was considered work, and so Jesus' disciples shouldn't be doing this. Now, when they got angry, Jesus told, you know, told them, hey, remember the story of King David when he went into the temple and ate the bread that was only reserved for the priests because he was really hungry and he gave it to his companions that were really hungry? 
Re- remember that? And, and what Jesus was trying to show the Pharisees is like, look, you're not all your traditions and all your stringent rules and all your legalism is not taking in account human need. It's not taking in account human need. And what Jesus then goes on to say is that, hey, uh, Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. In that statement, Jesus was telling the Pharisees, like, look, you have made the Sabbath this burden for the people because you've added all these traditions and laws to it as a way of earning favor with God. You have totally taken the Sabbath and made it something it's not, it was never meant to be. It was meant to be, Sabbath was made for man. That that they were to, the Sabbath was a gift. It was to be a delight. It was to be a day where they could receive physical and spiritual renewal. And you have taken it and you've turned this into a thing where man has to serve the Sabbath and it becomes this legalistic duty and a tremendous burden. And so Jesus wasn't saying like Sabbath is bad and I'm here to, you know, get rid of the Sabbath. He was condemning the way the Pharisees have had misused the Sabbath and what they had turned it into. And then Jesus makes this statement, I, I, the, son of the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And so what Jesus was saying was he was affirming the goodness of the Sabbath. And he was saying that, look, I created the Sabbath because we know Jesus is the Son of Man. I created the Sabbath. I, I, I made it, right? And so Jesus was Lord of the Sabbath. I think what else Jesus was saying was that the Sabbath was always meant to point to him. And the reason is, is because Jesus in him is where the deepest rest is found. Why is that the case? Because Jesus lived the life that we were supposed to live but couldn't, and then he died perfectly the death that we should have died for our rebellion. Why? So that when we put our trust in him as Lord and Savior, and we believe in him, and we receive him as our king, we can have his perfect performance record, his perfect life credited to our account, and our sinful life can be credited to his account. Um, And because he died in our place, we can receive forgiveness from sin. We, and because he rose from the dead and lives at the right hand of the Father, we can receive um, his power into our life that, that helps us to live victoriously over sin. And he gives us a new heart and we become adopted into God's family. And, um, and so we no longer have to find our significance and our security and our satisfaction in what we do for work. Ultimately, we don't have to find those things in him. In those things, we, we, we have this new identity in Christ. We know that we are significant in him. We know that we are satisfied, that true, deep satisfaction is found in him. We know that we are secure in God, the Father's love. And that is what gives us deep rest that the Sabbath was always meant to uh, point to. And so um, I would add the third, uh, the, the, to the stopping, noticing, and celebrating, I would add remembering, remembering what Jesus has done for us and remembering who we are in Christ for those of us who have put our trust in him. That is how we will rest well. And it's that remembering part that I think a lot of people are missing because they don't know Jesus, right? And so they may take a week off. They may take a weekend off. They may take a day a week off. But because they don't know Jesus, they're not truly at rest. They've never experienced that REM of the soul, that deeper rest that can be found in Jesus Christ. And so... There you have it. Um, You were made for rest. You were made to stop, notice, celebrate uh, your work and the fruit of your labor. And you were made to stop, notice, and remember uh, what Jesus has done for you so that you can have rest. He experienced inner turmoil. He experienced 
utter unrest as he was beaten, unfairly tried, and then crucified. He experienced all of that, all that unrest, so that you could experience deep, deep, soul-replenishing rest in him. And so I want to encourage you this week, how will you start to develop a pattern of rest the way that God designed it into your life? What will you say no to so that you can say yes to rest? So I, I mentioned how, you know, five years ago or so, I, I'm bad with time, but um, God really impressed upon my own heart, my need for rest and my need to um, practice the Sabbath. And, and I also have confessed, I confess to you that um, it's been my practice of rest has been inconsistent and messy at best. And, you know, I shared that at the beginning, it was really hard for me to rest, you know, that I so was addicted to the adrenaline rush of being productive and getting things done that I found it difficult to rest. But I'm so happy that uh, God empowered me to stick with um, leaning into developing this pattern of rest because although it's still messy and inconsistent, um, we... I think I've broken, God has allowed me to break into the sweetness of rest um, to the point that it's like I just can't wait every week for our day of rest. And so what does it look like practically for me in my own life is right now in this season of, of life, um, when Mary, since I work on Sundays, that's not a day of rest for, for me especially. So when Mary gets home on Fridays from work, usually around 5, 5.30, that's when our Sabbath starts as a family. That's when our day of rest starts. And we usually eat out Friday, meaning we, we and, you know, during COVID, it's mainly we go get food and bring it back home. But we eat something we want to wanna eat. Um, we, we, we have special, you know, treats and, and desserts. And we just, we celebrate. Um, and then our Sabbath, Sabbath continues into Saturday um, and goes through Saturday, right? So um, Saturday morning, we wake up slow. Mary and I, we have our coffee. Um, typically, we get to read some things we want to read or um, browse online. Uh, the boys get a little bit of video game time. And then what we try to do is we come together. And if, if we're on our game, we do a devotion as a family. If we're really on our game, I'll ask everybody, you know, what, what is one thing that you're really thankful that you were able to produce this week at school or in your work? And we just celebrate the goodness of, of the fruit of our, our labor. And we try and remember, too, during the devotion, um, Jesus' sacrifice for us and our identity in him and remind us of our identity ourselves of our identity in Christ because we know that's where deep rest is found. Then we typically in the morning Saturday, at least we try to do something fun together as a family, whether that's going hiking, whether that's playing, you know, basketball, whether that's playing baseball or football in the backyard. We, we try and do something where we really connect as a family. And then uh, the afternoon, uh, we reserve some time where we can each go do something that will refresh us, that we will enjoy. And then a lot of times Saturday evening, we will have friends over or have family over or, or do something fun that Saturday evening. And so that's, and we, I mean, we talk about like, we can't wait for Sabbath day. And we talk about, we use Eugene Peterson's words that Sabbath is to, for us to pray and play with God. And it's become such a life-giving practice for us. And so I just encourage you, um, you know, figure out what works for you in your season of life and for your family. It does not have to look like, you know, the way the cockerels do it. I think Jesus, gives us plenty of uh, room to, to figure out what is going to work best for us, what is really going to replenish our soul, what is really going to replenish our bodies, what is really going to allow us to focus on Jesus and have a heightened aware of his presence with us during our day of rest. <laughs>